You're listening to season two of the Mies podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, we're going to talk to high performers in the food business, everything from chefs to CEOs, technologists, writers, investors, and more about how they innovate and operate and how they consistently execute at a high level day after day. And I would really love it if you could drop us a five-star review anywhere that you listen to your podcast. That could be Apple, that could be Spotify, could be Google. I'm not picky. Anywhere works, but I really appreciate the support. And as always, I hope you enjoy the show. In today's episode, we deep dive into making super delicious bread. Our guest is Chef Avery Rusica, who's the owner and, of course, baker of Manresa Bread. They have a bunch of locations. And first of all, we get into a little bit of the weeds of baking bread. We talk about milling your own flour and why that's so special and the flavor profile that you can create from it. We talk about natural leavening and why that is so helpful with creating flavor, as well as why it helps with digestion and her thoughts on all-purpose flour and many other things. Then we start to dig into how she has scaled this business incredibly. When you start to hear Avery talk, it's very clear. Yes, she is an incredible baker and chef, but she's also really, really good operator and just understands the importance and the nuance of scale. So we talk a lot about the challenges and the way that she's approached scaling her business, Manresa Bread, and all the sort of trials and tribulations along the way. I learned a lot. I think you're going to learn a lot as well, not just about a lot of really fun, you know, tips and tricks on baking bread, but of course on what it's like to scale a business with delicious food and make sure that it stays consistently delicious across many locations. So Avery, thank you so much for the time. I had a blast. And as always, I hope that everybody enjoys the conversation as much as I did. So nice to meet you. I wanted to say, you know, we have a bunch of bakers on my team, even though we're a tech company. So I did send a bunch of notes like, hey, what do you all want to ask Avery? So you're going to get some pretty pointed questions about baking. So if it gets a little little granular, you know, is what it is. No, that's great. Great. I love that. Curious, by the way, I I know you you worked in New York for George at Aldea and you worked, you know, Priscilla Bouchon. But you're not from New York, right? I think you're from the, are you from the South or? No, I'm from North Carolina originally. Nice. What part? Greensboro, so the Piedmont. So I did my undergrad at Chapel Hill and I went to boarding school up actually in, in Asheville. So, but my parents moved to North Carolina. So like I'm the first generation. So not really, no real Southern accent. My mom is from Chicago. My dad's from Connecticut. And he was a professor of history, of ancient history. And so he got a teaching position at the un- one of the universities, specifically University of UNCG Greensboro. And so then he moved there and my mom as well. And then I was born there. So Wow, that's awesome. Are you are you a history buff as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love stories, right? And so history, whether it's I mean, there there's a story in anything. And I think that that's kind of like I love storytelling. I what got me into cooking was actually wanting to be a food writer. And I had been living in France and I had one more year of college to finish back in the United States. So I'd come back and I was thinking, okay, if I want to write about food, I should get a job in a kitchen so that I know what that's like, because I think that that's just a thing we should do, right? If you're going to write about food, you should at least have worked in a professional kitchen at some point. And then I, so for the summer before I was going to start school again, I started working in actually two kitchens. So I was like working like 20 plus hours, you know, I was working and I loved, but I loved it. I was so happy and I totally fell in love with kitchens. And so then that's how I, that's why after finishing my undergraduate degree, I decided to move up to New York to go to a culinary school there because I didn't want to go to the CIA after having done, you know, many, you know, I did, I took five years to graduate because I'd gone to France for over a year. And so it was like, I wanted to do something that could grow some skill sets for me, but not have to be, you know, another three years or two years at CIA. You ended up going to ICC, right? Uh, yeah, I went to, at that point, it was the French Culinary Institute. Oh, it the yeah, International yeah. Culinary Institute. But uh, yeah, I did. It was great. Yeah. Um, I did their savory program and their bread program. Nice. Yeah. So 
random, but I heard a rumor that you love your calendar and like making sure that everything's on your calendar. Is that true? Yes. Yes. I, do. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that it's very, there's a lot going on. And I mean, even still, I find it like a lot to juggle. And I think if I have a calendar, I, one, one of the things I feel like is like today's version of Avery makes better decisions for her future than like, if I have to make decisions today on my day, I don't always make the best decisions. But if I made the decisions a day ahead or a week ahead and follow those decisions, I do really well. Do you know what I mean? Like in the moment, oh, yeah, I'm more impulsive, whereas if I'm a little bit removed from it. So I like a calendar because it's like, what am I supposed to do? Oh, okay. I made a plan. So there, I'll just follow my plan. That's all you have to do in theory. A hundred percent. I'm also like a fanatic for calendars. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I also, I love just jamming through a prep list, you know, yes. like just, you know, like, okay, I got an event tomorrow. Like here's yes. everything I have to do. I'm going to time out. I know that it's going to yes. take me about an hour to make this sauce and I got to prep this stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I, then I can just, I spend a lot of time up you front and then just follow, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I'm definitely an overthinker and it can get a little paralyzing. And so when I make the lists, like, then it's like, okay, I've set this time aside. I've thought through these things. So then yeah. you can just, now you can just act. You don't have to, you know, you don't get bogged down because sometimes you get yeah. bogged down during the list making, but it's like all of your actual work and thinking has happened during that time. Then the actual job itself, whatever it might be, is not, you can kind of just enjoy it sort of. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, what's interesting is to-do lists are pretty irrelevant if they aren't relative to the amount of time you have to do the to-do list. Mm -hmm. So you could have a like a checklist of all the things I got to do today. But yeah. if it, that list takes you 14 hours and you have yes. 13 hours, then it's just not getting done. No, so that's why sure. I love putting everything in my calendar. Yeah. Even if it's not granular, like just even if it just says like, okay, task block two hours, yeah. strategy two hours. Yeah. I totally agree. And anytime I meet anybody that, that uses their calendar that way, I get really Yeah, excited. no, I definitely feel the same way. And it really... Gosh, again, like, I think the biggest thing for me is just like, how do you balance? Because as big as we are in some ways, we are also very small, My like the company. And so I, I wear, like any business owner, a lot of different hats. And, and I'm, it, I'm excited about those hats that I wear. But sometimes then it's like, okay, if I don't have this to-do list, like today, for example, before this morning... I went to my Campbell store and one of the things I've learned to do is be much more realistic with how much time I need to allot things. Like I'm definitely trying to do less variety of things with each day and have more like a day be a specific kind of area of the company that's really working for me. And so I went to Campbell and I'm, of course, tomorrow there's a whole bunch of things I want to worry about that are maybe more involved with like the production side. I'm very good at like being like, this is blinders on right and then everything yes. else is waiting yeah. that was not something i could do at first and it's it, that's been a big help to get to that place because otherwise you just feel like you like you'll be working really hard and getting nothing done because you're too totally. scattered right totally by the way i call it this app that i use to a lot of people and now i'm yeah i'm actually having the founders of the company that built this app it's a calendar app it's called reclaim they're coming to the podcast but i love it and it's yeah. it's like an ai based calendar that helps you to time block things and it'll yeah. automatically move things around. That's great. I'll look that up. I've seen I've seen ads for some of the AI calendar. Yeah, I've tried a bunch. This one tends to work the best. You know, the other thing, I, I don't actually do this, but I've heard people that do this is you're probably like, look, if we have businesses, we own businesses, we worry yeah. all the time. I'm sure you're like, at least I know I do worry all the time. And it, you know, there's always anxiety. What's going to happen? Now? You know, I've heard of people that actually schedule time to worry. Oh, so really? That they, yeah, so that they know, okay, you know, I'm not gonna worry about this now because I know that tomorrow at 2 p.m. to 2.30 oh, so is like funny. my worry time. Yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. I have not done that, but I definitely, once you get enough time with a low level of, like my anxiety levels have changed dramatically because now it's like you expect the hit, like it's gonna happen, it'll be okay, you'll get through it, things happen. So I'm a much less of a, I don't have as much anxiety worrying, which is good, which is good. I'll take it, you know? And hey, that's what uh, makes good, I am happy you. to maybe outsource worrying to some other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about Manraiser bread today, but I think yeah. to start, we're going to get a little bit in the weeds of just okay. baking, if that's cool. Sure. So first question for you. And I don't usually do it this way, by the way. I don't usually like just like drill in with some questions, but I want 
learned some stuff. And I think other people get a lot of like value out of just hearing some of these like things. I'm happy to talk about bread always. Can you talk about, pontificate about, expound on the benefits of milling your own flour versus buying? Sure. And a couple of sort of ancillary things there are like, uh-huh. because you all mill a lot of your own flour, except bread flour. So I want to know why you didn't mill bread sure. flour. So wh- why don't we start there and then have some other stuff. When I, if we back up to the beginning of the bakery, I had been baking. I loved baking. We were going to open, I was baking at Manresa. I was making the bread for Manresa and I was selling the bread at Farmer's Market and everything was great. Okay. So we're going to be opening a bakery. We're already at that point where I'm in my career where like we've got investors, the bakery's funded. We're going to open a bakery. And I took this trip back to New York to visit some baker friends and to visit some bakeries. And then I went down to North Carolina and I went and did a stage at a bakery up in the mountains outside of Asheville. And so when I went to New York, I visited, you know, all of the bakeries that were around at the time and had a lot of really tasty bread. And then I went to this bakery outside of Asheville and I had the bread at this bakery. And it was after, you know, so I'd had this concentrated week of eating bread. And I go to this bakery called Farm and Sparrow and it was like, what is this? What is this bread? You know? And it was, he was milling his own flour. And it was this, I could just taste the difference. And it was incredible. And it was like, what, why does this taste so different? What, what is this? This is like, this bread doesn't even look like, it's like, you know, you don't know what's going on. And I, so it was the first, it was a real takeaway from all of these like amazing bakeries the one bread that was memorable was from fresh milled flour. So that really got me like curious about fresh milled flour. And I'm a curious person. So I like to, you know, I love ingredients. I like the stories of ingredients. I think, you know, I think that's a passion. I live in California. So it's like we have the best, some of the best, you know, growing climate, et cetera, in the United States. And so when it was just thinking about what we wanted to do for the business, it was like, well, I want to I want everything to be the best it can be. And so it became very clear to me that milling our own flour was was important in that process. And so I ended up going up to the bread lab as well, which is at Washington State, and visiting the what 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 is called the bread lab, which is like it, it now is in a slightly different location, but it used to be part of an adjunct facility campus of their the ag school. And so same got to talk to farmers and like academic farmers about like grain and nu- the nutritional values and you know what's in the flour like what we're you know learning more about flour so you know a wheat berry has multiple parts it has the endosperm it and then it has the the bran and the germ and so when we mill flour fresh if we're milling whole grain flour which is what we currently do we're taking the entire piece of berry and we're utilizing the whole thing and the biggest thing that happens, so there are flavor components in in flour, like, you know, they're kind of a little bit heady in the sense, like, you're not going to taste, I don't think it's like, this is a raspberry, Yeah, I got you. this is a banana, like, those are two very different flavors, but wheat berries and different varieties, we do have different flavors, and they definitely have different colors, and they have different aromas, and so milling your own flour starts with just like what kind of, you know, so you have choices. So I think that was part of what was I was curious about too. What choices can I make as a baker? What can I manipulate? What, how can I express myself in a creative way or my creativity and my curiosity and also make the most tasty thing? And I think the biggest thing to understand as kind of a, a non-professional baker about using fresh milled flour or purchased flour And at this point, we're not even talking about whether it's sifted or whole grain, but just fresh versus fresh milled, you were milling yourself or bought off the shelf at the grocery store already milled, is the freshness itself. And the freshness of freshly milled flour allows it to absorb a dramatically different quantity of hydration. And this is really what's fundamental oh, to in the yeah. bread making process. It's it, it, There's a different mentality to think about if you're talking about making pastries. But when you're thinking mm-hmm. about making bread, it's the the hydration level that it not only will, will support, but really requires when you use fresh milled flour. So the exact same recipe utilizing purchased organic 
whole grain already milled flour Mm -hmm. will absorb a dramatically smaller amount of water. Yeah. Okay. So because of that, when you think about what is fermentation and specifically sourdough fermentation, sourdough fermentation is the process in which yeast is eating the sugar that's in the flour and then it is multiplying. And in order for yeast to live, it needs access to food and water, just like any other kind of like living kind of organism. So it is using, so the the higher hydration is supporting a higher level of activity and fermentation. And then the fermentation is not only breaking down the gluten, but the lactic acids and the acetic acids that are produced by the fermentation process of the yeast is breaking down as well the protein structure and it is processing the flour itself so that when we eat a piece of bread that was made with fresh milled is a fresh milled sourdough loaf versus a off the shelf but same exact recipe sourdough loaf it's going to be a lower quantity of hydration and it's going to be a lower level of fermentation so and then that fermentation what we experience then as the as the person eating this piece, the slice of bread is a better mouthfeel, a better texture. It's also going to last longer because it's got more hydration in it, like even Mm -hmm. after baking, better like activity. So like the crumb itself, and obviously there's different recipes and different things people are looking for in a crumb. Sometimes you want a more open crumb, sometimes you don't. But the, the texture itself, like what it literally feels like to like chew that piece of bread because of that high hydration and because of that fermentation, is just going to be an all around better, better slice, yeah. right? And then additionally, it's going to be better for your digestion because so much of this wheat itself was processed, if you will, pre processed by the sourdough fermentation. So the work your body has to do to digest it is much less, which is why some people who feel like they are, obviously, celiac disease is a thing, but some people who feel like they are wheat adverse or sensitive Mm -hmm. to wheat find that when they eat truly properly fermented breads, especially if they're made with fresh milled flour, they actually are fine. I mean, and that's a little bit like anecdotal depending on the person, but we definitely find that with customers. We have a lot of customers who say, I can eat your bread. I don't eat bread pretty anywhere else, but I do eat your bread, you know, and 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 it's so that all of those things together. So, so that's why we mill our own flour because we truly taste a difference between, and it's the same grains of it. So let's say I don't want to make, for some reason, I decide to buy a bag of milled flour. I'm using the exact same variety of grain, like hard red wheat from grown in California, organically grown. And I'm using the same exact recipe. It is a very different loaf of bread, like our 100% whole grain loaf of bread that we make very different, t- completely can taste the difference, even though it was made with exactly the same wheat berry because of the freshness of the flour. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes so much sense. There's like the obvious, you know, I just sort of associate it with my dumb, savory chef brain of like, yeah. well, you know, fresh ground spices are better than, you know, yeah. spices that were ground a long time ago. But there's all these downstream effects that I didn't realize the really the downstream effects are so dramatic, and the flavor in terms of like the freshness, the flavor is definitely there. But again, it's a little bit more like you taste the whole thing, and the whole thing is because of the hydration of the fermentation that was allowed because of this fresh milled flour. So it's like you can't even access those flavors unless you're doing all of these, you know, because obviously most of us are sitting around eating, you know, you know, handfuls or spoonfuls yeah. of raw yeah. flour, but. What about the consistency, not um in terms of texture, but maintaining the consistency? Like what hydration you're supposed to use? Are there difficulties of like, is it dynamic in that each time you have to sort of test? It's a little bit dynamic. It's more dynamic in the beginning process of making a bread. So like in the in the creation of a new product. That's the most dynamic element. I mean, that's a big thing we factor into our recipe development because we have pretty good continuity with our teams. Like if people leave, they're typically leaving for because of a move somewhere, you know, that we almost, we very infrequently knock on wood, have people leaving because they're like, I don't like working here. It's pretty much almost always something dramatic, like I'm moving, my boyfriend and I are moving or, you know, so, so 
But we keep these things in mind because we don't want, we want to make the best thing, but we want to do it, you know, to some scale for sure at this point with five stores. And, you know, we'd like to have continue to grow the business. And so the dynamic has more to do with the training process. So at correctly training people to utilize the mill, maintaining the mill. Is it more about the mill or the, like if you have, it's if you're buying the, the sweet berry and you like, you, it's more do you about know the every mill. time it's 72% hydration or? Yeah. So the consistency from the vendor itself of like, hey, this is a hard red wheat berry. We find much less inconsistency with the grain side. What you find more inconsistency with occasional inconsistency, it doesn't happen very frequently, is with purchased flour. Because purchased flour, you were asking about bread flour, for example. Purchased flour, that's it's what we call we would say it's sifted flour. It's so they've had they've taken the bran and the germ out of the flour. So you're just having the endosperm. And then what the grain companies do is blend typically the flour that we get, it is sifted and then it is combined. So like it is not necessarily one kind of flour. They've taken maybe different batches of flour and combined them to hit the protein content that you're looking for. So the protein content in in American flour is we just communicate one thing. We communicate just a protein content. So, and you go anywhere from your cake flour, which is the lowest protein content up to like a bread flour or even almost like a reinforced bread flour. In Europe, they also give you a number that's about elasticity of the dough too, which is really interesting, but we don't, extensibility kind of factor of the dough but that's not how it's communicated in the United States. So what we purchase is a sifted flour. And the reason we purchased that is because we didn't have a sifter. And so now we actually have a sifter and we're in the process of kind of defining how we want to be including that in our process. We're not at a place where we would be sifting 100% of our flour, but for example, like, I mean, definitely for the pastry department, we'll be utilizing that. So like, we'll you know, putting on a banana cake that has is 100% made with sifted flour that's sifted in-house. Because, you know, some pastries are great with whole grain flour. Some pastries, not everybody. Either. And I'm more of like, I see flour as an ingredient coming from like a chef background as well. Like, I'm not like a die hard like everything has to be whole grain or yeah. everything has to be fresh milk. It's about like, where is this going to impact the overall product? And be better, be a better product. And so we currently purchase sifted bread flour because, and and then all of our breads are either, they go anywhere from being 100% whole grain or combination, but we don't really make any bread that doesn't have any sifted flour in it or fresh milled flour, except for like an enriched dough, like a brioche or a brioche currently yeah, doesn't yeah, have. Gotcha. But otherwise everything else is is has some variety or some quantity of sifted flour or fresh milled flour up to a hundred percent. And so we see it as more like, what are you trying to get? And then again, it's, we use bread flour because it's an ingredient. And like, if you're going to use a fresh milled flour, but you want the loaf to have some kind of higher, like, like size, because you want to use it for a sandwich. So you want something that has a little bit more structure to it, then incorporating some percentage of bread flour to help create just a little bit structure is, and so that's how we really look at it is like, what are we trying to accomplish? And then what are the right components to get there? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Keith Justo is the flour company you were talking about, right? Well, there's Justo's, Keith Justo Bakery Supply is the distributor. And then for whatever reason, I'm blanking because now Justo's is a bread company as well. And I can't believe I'm forgetting this KG. That's okay. We can find it later. It yeah, or you yeah. can Google it. But what's your thoughts on I mean, this is, it's so funny how flour, and I love this, that, you know, you can go so deep on flour. And I mean, look, yeah. I love Sir Galahand all-purpose flour. I mean, they're, they're, it's a great do, flour. Yeah. But yeah. when I hear you talking about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is your thoughts on just all-purpose flour in general as a product to use? Add in, it's Central Milling that I was like, oh, Central losing milling. my mind. Cool. Central Milling is the company. I think that home bakers... Working with it, having an AP flower is great. You know, what I think is though interesting and one of the things if I, you know, am teaching people or talking to people about baking and they're maybe like, they've been trying to make something at home and they're like either, you know, why is your version of this seem like it comes out so much better or I'm not happy with this or I want to tweak this. What I think people don't really understand, I think most of us don't understand if you're just baking at home and never have had any like, real background in bread 
or baking in general is that baking isn't magic, right? Whether it's pastry side or bread side, it's science. And it might seem magical, but it, it it's really about the properties of the ingredients you're utilizing. And so I think with AP, well, I'm totally pro AP flour. I think it's something that like, it would be so helpful for people to know sometimes like, maybe the reason you're not happy with something is because of the product you're using. And so I think that that's where there's, you know, just if you think about like the branding, all purpose flour, well, it, it is and it isn't, <laughs> right? Like, um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you want something to be a little bit more delicate, like a biscuit, but you want it to be really tender. Maybe you should be using a portion of AP flour, but also a portion of cake flour, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I think that there's, that's something just like where I think it's a, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit deceiving, I guess, you know, in the sense that like you can't, you cannot necessarily achieve what you're looking for with AP flour and changing the flour or even a portion of the flour could have a dramatic result yeah, for your final, yeah. for the thing you're making, yeah. right? Whatever, yeah. how about a white lily flour? I used to it's love making biscuits. Right? Well, we used to buy it. My parents buy it. Yeah. It is so it. good for biscuits. Like drop It is so good. That's exactly right. We have it at our house in North Carolina. My parents love to cook. And so, yep, we get white lily flour. Yeah. I don't see it anywhere so in the tender. stores, but yeah. it is. I've, yeah. I've never seen it. I've never seen it on the West Coast. I've never seen it. This show is brought to you by, you guessed it, Mies. Mies helps thousands of restaurants and food service businesses all over the world build profitable menus and scale their business successfully. If you're looking to organize your recipe IP and train your team to put out a consistent product every day in less time than ever before, then Mies is just for you. And you can transform all those old Google Docs and Word Docs and PDFs and spreadsheets and Google Sheets into dynamic, actionable recipes in Mies in lightning speed. Plus, stop all that manual work of processing invoices because Mies will digitize all your purchases automatically. And there's a built-in database of ingredient yields, prep yields, and unit of measure conversions for every ingredient, which means you're going to get laser accurate food costs in a fraction of the time. Visit www.getmees.com. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z.com to learn more. And check out the show notes moving forward because we're going to be adding promotions and discount codes so that all of you lovely and brilliant Mees podcast listeners get a sweet deal on Mees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get out of the weeds a little bit okay. here with the, with the flower. And I am going to read a quote that I read from you that okay. really resonated with me. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it means for you. So you said, it's great to be the least knowledgeable person in the room. This means you're in a room full of people who are experts. Every day in the kitchen is an opportunity to learn something new. If you surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. I, this is like something I live so much of my life by. Yeah. I always want to be the dumbest person in the, in the group of folks that are around because I will leave that place knowing everything that they know plus what I know. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's such a great mentality. I'm curious for you, and I think about it for myself as well, like, you know, you now have a business that's growing. It's grown a bunch. You've been baking for a very long time. Like, how do you continue to grow and learn and surround yourself with more people that know things that you don't as you're scaling your business and just generally as you're growing as a person? I mean, I think that... That mentality is something I just take with me. And so in a sense that it leads the choices I make, right? So like in some ways, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will create opportunities for yourself to continue to learn if you love to learn. And so that's just like innately built into the choices we make. So like I, def I think about it a lot, actually, because it's like, well, it's definitely about attitude. You have to have the right attitude, as in you have to have a, an attitude of curiosity and you have to go into the day thinking, what are you going to learn today? Because I, I, I got some really good advice when I first started cooking. And I was like, when I was at Aldea, there was actually a really great group of, of like line cooks there who had much more experience than me. And one of them was a slightly older guy who's, I think he was from um, Highland and he had like traveled all over the world working. And he said, every day you write down what you learned, write down a couple, like, it's kind of like almost like a gratitude journal, right? Like, and so I, and he was like, you write down what you learned and you write down what you either like, maybe it's a mistake you made or a thing you want to do better the next day. And I would, you know, take the subway back and forth because I lived in Harlem and I worked down, you know, I mean, Aldea was gosh, like, you know, off Union Square. And so, you know, I was on the subway a lot and it was like, so I just, on top of having my little, like, you know, little notebook with all my recipes in it, 
I would jot down, this was kind of a little bit like before we had such massive cell phones, I feel like, like where you now take notes in, in the cell phone, but I would jot down, I would do that. And it was like, it was such a way to be present in what you were doing and like, and, and going into work with the right attitude. Because like, at that point I was going to school every day. School was a little bit like, not, it wasn't a waste of time, but it was like, I was already cooking and you had kids in the classes who were, who had never cooked, who were like, I think I want to be a chef. Or, and then you had people who were a little bit more like me. And so that was, I looked at school before I was doing the bread program, but especially in the savory program as a place to like practice and create opportunities. But it was more about the creating opportunities. Like the reason I wanted to go to that culinary school was because of, I looked at the chefs that had come out of there and had successful businesses. So like David Chang went there, the original guy who founded Cezanne, the, you know, Christina Tosi, like all of these people who had successful businesses had gone through there. So it was like, okay, I see this, like, I see people being successful. And then they were connected with so many great chefs. And so it was an opportunity to like meet so many chefs, et cetera. So now that I own my own business, we decided to be a business that was going to grow. So, you know, I could have had a bakery where we make everything and we sell it in the same location and that's a done deal. And then that's kind of like you're in a little world. Well, no, no, we wanted to have a commissary where we make everything. Okay, so you're constantly having to solve problems. You're constantly, and if you're growing, you're having to both solve new problems. You have to like, so there's just, it's just innate in every day. And, yeah, and I'm yeah. lucky enough to have a business that's been successful. So same thing, we've we've kind of put the challenges in front of ourselves. Like we went through a multi-million dollar expansion in the last couple of years between three new stores in 2023 and then in, well, no, th- three new stores in 2022 and then moving into our new commissary in 2023. So we literally are celebrating like our one year in this new commissary. And it's just always about like, what have I learned? How can I do this better? I tell my team that I'm not attached to anything except for the quality of what we do and like the safety and kind of like contentedness of our employees. If, as long as people are safe and kind to one another, and as long as what we're making is delicious, the way we do it, I don't care. It, as in if you think it would make more sense for us to, for a reason, for whatever reason you might have, to mix our Levon bread in the evenings instead of in the mornings, let's talk about it. You know, not being too attached to anything except for having guidelines that you live by. So we have to like perform those two things. So I'm not going to make a change if it's going to make everybody miserable, but I am going to work towards a change even if people aren't totally on board with it yet because I think it might make something better. So like we're going through that with our pastry team right now. We're going to, we have some pieces of equipment that when we moved into our new facility, the equipment that I purchased for this facility, we moved all of our old equipment and then we repurchased new things. Some of that is really simple things like additional ovens, but some of it is the idea was to make the job easier for the employee physically so that they had more energy to focus on the creative and the quality side of what we were doing. So we have what we call, it's called a cutting table. So when we make our, when you make a croissant, you use your sheeting table to lock in the dough with the butter, right? And then you sheet it out and then you have to, so now you have a long roll of croissant dough and now you have to cut it and you have to cut it into the shapes for the croissant or the pain au chocolat or whatever it has, maybe. So we now have a machine where you take the dough off one, mach- the sheeter, and you take it over to this other machine and it basically runs down the top of the machine and it, there's a wheel, it's very simple mechanics. There's a wheel two different wheels and they cut the croissant because when I looked at the croissant process, cutting croissants, there is a some skill to it. You need to cut it correctly. You need to cut it the right shape, but it's not a particularly interesting job cutting croissants. Yeah, it's definitely a rote job, but it has to be accurate. It has to be accurate. Accuracy is the issue. Whereas the the shaping of the croissant, how you roll it up, all of that, that's Mm -hmm. much more impactful. And so it was like, well, if we can use this machine to cut them, now the employees, number one, it's much more efficient. Number two, they're freed up to do, to have more time to create more. So it's just, I think of, I mean, I just see places to learn always, you know, sometimes the hard part is more like I can see, and that's where I'm working on growing as a manager, continuing to grow as a manager, I think, and having the right people around you who are okay, you know, who give you that feedback, right? Like it's, it's up here for me. Every, you know, what to do, what's going to happen next, how to make it happen, but how I, but I can't physically do it. Like that's the bakery's way too big for me to physically do everything myself now. So learning how to communicate my plan or learning how to communicate 
like the scope of a, a concept or an idea and then working with my managers and my team members to implement a plan or for them to fill in the details that's definitely something I'm getting much better at but like that took a lot of time both for me to get better and for me to have enough of a structured team around me that could that both yeah. knew the company yeah. knew what my ethos were knew where we were trying to go cuz and now that's exciting cuz I'm not the only knowledge holder. I can be like the idea person because, and then I can come with the idea and say, like, for example, we're going to be putting a tomato soup and a grilled cheese on the menu soon, right? And so like, that's something we wanted to do as a team. We wanted, you know, so, but then how you actually start that process or implement the process in the stores, in the cafes, that's something that I want my store managers to be a part of, right? Like, okay, like, how are you going to use the equipment in the store to to heat up the grilled cheese? How many, just like, because it's, there's a lot of moving parts. Things can be much more complicated than you could ever imagine. Like you would think a grilled cheese and a tomato soup, easy, but it, it's not. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially at scale with that many just locations. Exactly. Like there's sure. just so many questions you have to answer. And so we're getting so much better with our systems yeah. about doing that. But yeah, there's always, I mean, there's no lack of, places to learn. <laughs> yeah. It's fun though. You know, I think that's one, oh, of, the, one of the best parts of it is, you, is that's um, why I love being you a business know. owner because I'm not, because you, you get to use all the parts of your brain and you get to make changes and, and then you learn if you want to get better, like that's your responsibility. So it's like, it's on me to be better, not just on my team members to be better. It's on me to figure out if we're not getting the results I want. And we have really good, nice, really nice, great people working for us. So it's not just this, like, why aren't you doing this? It's like, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. What are we not understanding? What's not being communicated? And so much gets lost in communication. So it's, you know, that's something we work really hard on. And I, I yeah. agree, it's very fun. Yeah, I think as you scale too, I think the thing that, I struggle with the similar thing of, you know, there's mm -hmm. a concept in my head that I want my team to implement and making sure they understand fully what, like we, yeah. we oftentimes oh, I know. overestimate what we think people grasp yes. about the idea that we have. Yes. But the fun thing as you start to scale a business, which you're clearly now doing, is the more you involve everyone downstream, actually, the more effective it's going to be. I remember- A thousand percent, a thousand Last percent. season, um, Ron Parker, really, really smart operator. He used to run Union Square Hospitality Group. Now he's oh, yeah. the CEO of Jose Andres Group said a lot of what he did was development, like building out new new restaurants, right? So like designing yeah. everything from the design to the space, such as something that he said that stuck with me was was how much he involves the staff in the oh, design yeah. of new restaurants. Because to Absolutely. your point, yeah, a grilled cheese and tomato seems very simple. But Absolutely. where are you going to store all that bread? Where's the cheese going to live? storage. Like, it's Huge sliced, problem. you know? Yeah. You, you know, like once it comes out of the, of the toaster, or the convection or whatever it is, yeah. where's that going to land? If you have 10 of them. How do you yeah. land 10 of them at the same time? Where no, are you going to wrap totally. it up? If it adds up, but the biggest mistake I think that folks make that it sounds like you're not making, which is amazing, is just assuming that you'll figure that out and then hand it to the team as opposed to getting them involved because then they no. also have ownership. And Again, like retention of a team members is so important, right? Because it takes time. It takes time to learn each other's language. It takes time to get to know some of these strengths and weaknesses too. So, you know, I'm very lucky. My parents really wanted like, that my parents were just are incredible parents. And so they were extremely supportive and really believed in like raising well-rounded children. So it was really important that we spoke multiple languages and all of those things. So like I speak Spanish fluently. If I didn't speak Spanish fluently, I have no idea how I do my job because it makes a complete difference in what kind of leader I can be for my company because I have a ton of Spanish speaking team yeah. members between the retail stores and the production facility. And so I can go into a store like this morning, I went to my Campbell store and it was our first cafe. And it, we opened that cafe in 2018. And so it had multiple years of operation before the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, everything shifted. When we first opened, we didn't have DoorDash. It was not a part, component of our business whatsoever. Obviously, during the pandemic, we launched it and then we've maintained it. And it's a, quite a big part of our, of our cafe model now just because of this popularity. And so like while the store was very thoughtfully designed, it's had to pivot its use in, in certain areas. So like We've been going through a big process of kind of like, again, hearing from the employees, like we used to have a portion of the line that was in the front of the store and, and then the rest in the back. And when the pandemic happened, the front of the house became where they were like staging all of their to-go orders, right? And so mm -hmm. like the feedback from the employees was like, no, we'd prefer to have 
all of the kitchen things happening in the kitchen. Okay, well, how do we move this equipment? And what can we get? You know, how do we? So even this morning, we're over there doing that. And I'm getting feedback from the employees. And we're doing it in English. And we're doing it in Spanish. And it's like, yeah. if I couldn't do that, it would you'd be like, it'd be like trying to do your job, you know, shape bread with one hand, which I'm sure people can do, but it's not necessarily the most efficient thing to do. Right. So yeah, yeah, I definitely, and I don't know. And it's so nice not to know everything. I'm so happy not to have to know everything. Cause for a long time, I felt like I had to know everything because we were a young company. I knew I didn't know everything, but I didn't have anybody else to be like, okay, how are we going to problem solve this? Like we didn't have a very experienced team. I knew nothing about retail. I'd never worked in retail in my life. Neither had my business partner, Andrew. He and, he and I kind of run the day-to-day or, you know, especially at the beginning, he and I were running the day-to-day. And so it was hard, you know, but now it's like, I can talk to somebody. I can say like, hey, you know, Randy, who's my store manager in Los Gatos, like, what are your thoughts on like how the line is working? Like, what do you, you know, and they have an educated opinion and experience. And, yeah, and then we can yeah. build off of that together. So it, it's great. Yeah. I love that. I'm curious, I don't know if you think about this, but clearly it's been successful, right? You launched it, mm-hmm. now there's a, a a bunch of locations. The bread is obviously fucking delicious. What else is contributing to the success? Because it's got to be more than the bread, right? Because there's a lot of yeah, delicious bread. I, I think what, what do you think is making this concept work so well? I mean, obviously it's a lot of hard work. I think we have very clear standards of what we're trying to do. I think there's a lot of determination. I They sound kind of cliche, but what I mean by that is I mean, there are highs and lows in any company, right? Like you have to know that, like we've had bad hires. We've had team members who've like taken us in, you know, where you realize, oh gosh, like, cause you don't know who somebody is till you know, right? So we've had people who were like, gosh, this person seems like they're going to do so great. And then you start to hear yeah. that, no, not so much. Yeah. And then you got to kind of rebuild a culture when you get that person gone because, the, you know, the employees around that person are a little gun shy, et cetera. So I think that, I think I think it's about being curious. I think it's about being willing to evolve. You got to have confidence in yourself that you can solve problems and believe in yourself that you're going to get through tough stuff. But you also have to have not too much of an ego to say, look, if, if I'm getting feedback that this thing that I thought was great, people aren't enjoying, I got to hear that feedback, like yeah, whatever it yeah, might be, yeah. you know? And from a brand perspective, like those are things that like how you operate, but yeah, how customers are resonating with this. Yeah, this brand. well, I think it has to do with in a bakery, quality and consistency in any brand, quality and consistency have to be at the forefront of what you're doing. And I mean that on on a product side, but I also mean that on a customer service side. So our training process is something we're always improving and spending a lot of time on. So how we tell our brand story, how people experience the store, like our spaces, all of those things I think are not taking things for granted as a brand, I think is really important because that's something we really talk a lot with our staff because we have a a strong brand and we have a strong customer following. And so one thing we really push with our, our retail side is that you can't rest on your laurels just because people come in. So like we, we can even see sometimes the salesmanship and the experience that I observe sometimes in some of our busiest stores can sometimes not be as high as it is in some of our smaller stores. And we talk to our staff about that because the staff in the busier store sort of expects, like, I don't want to say they expect the sale, but people come in, they know what they want and they leave, right? So the person doesn't have to work that hard sometimes to do their job. And so we really are like, talk to them about like, what does it mean to be impact, impactful employee? Like you always, you know, what, what are our points of service? When do you greet a customer? So I think, you know, doing that yeah. stuff day in and day out. I mean, we all read, you know, Setting the Table, the Danny Meyer book, and it's just, it's about coming back every day and doing the same job. And if you can't can't do that, if you don't have the, the attitude to do that with your brand, I think brands get lost, right? I think people get lost because something gets becomes successful and you forget why. And then- if the employees yeah, change yeah, or that. whatever. Yeah. I love that. So you have six locations now? Is that- I have five stores and then our commissary is and like commissary. So we have six, Got it. Yeah, six buildings. So what are you still not delegating today that you're like, mm, pretty sure like I need to get this off my plate soon? Mm, it's hard. That's hard. I really talked to my team, my management team about, are you doing a job that only you can do? If you're doing a job, if you're doing a job someone else can do, 
obviously you need to pitch in and jump in here and there. But if the majority, if you look at the breakdown of your work week and you spent the majority of your job doing the same job that like if you're a store manager and you, the, how you spent your week, the entire week was just bringing customers up, then we need to talk about your choices. And so what I mean by that is when you ask me like what I delegate, I, I don't think that there's a thing. I really try to spend my time doing things. And a lot of my day is like with other managers, right? Whether it's a pastry chef or whether it's a baker or whether it's a cook or it's working with them. That's really my job or how I see my job because I can plan where I want the company to go. And that that part, like I'm not going to delegate that to somebody, myself and, you know, Andrew and David, like we're taught, we talk about where we want the company to be, but that we're not going to get there without me helping the team move in that direction. So I think in this last year, this facility has really helped me feel like I'm in the right like using my time correctly, right? And and because as a business owner as, and as a woman to some degree too, I think for a long time, there was like a lot of like guilt. Like if I'm doing this thing, I should be doing this other thing too, but you can't do two things simultaneously and you can't really multitask. Like you're just gonna do two things, not that great. So I'm not saying I have it all figured out. I'm just saying in terms of delegation, I try not to do jobs that I can't, that somebody could do better than me. So like, I don't wanna do the, dis- I wanna have a input about the graphic design But I don't want to do the graphic design because somebody else is going to be better at that and faster at it, right? So, but I want to be a part of the process. So I I really try not to do things like I'm not going to, I'm like, I'm going to go with my pastry team next week and I'm going to work with the pastry team all week next week because they're not using some of the equipment the way that I think there's efficiencies we're not finding. Mm -hmm. And I want to put more products on the menu and we're hoping to grow our wholesale. So, and I don't want to hire many more employees. So I don't expect them to solve that problem by themselves. Yeah, I yeah. that's my job, and I like problems. You're such an operator. It's so funny. Yeah. Here, you, here you talk, it's just <laughs> it's very clear. I mean, like, that wasn't always the case at all. Yeah, maniacal might be the wrong word, but like the very detailed approach to because yes. it's true. You you know, look, there's no that's how you like, get somewhere. If you don't yeah, have there's a no plan, like one thing that makes it work exactly. You have to just get all these things to hum. I definitely have gone too far in the other direction and too far. I've done it all. You know what I mean? So like you're talking to me at a specific moment, but I've been the person who was 1000% killing myself and not having enough maturity business-wise to understand I was the owner and I could hire more people if that's what, like not trusting my decisions, right? And so, and I was the one who suffered for that. And then the opposite direction of hiring people and maybe giving them a little too much sort of like hands off and then being like, well, this isn't yeah. what I want. Yeah, look, like, it's, it's so hard, right? Yeah. You don't know, like, how much am I supposed to dig in? How much do I give up? And yeah. As the entrepreneur and as the operator, the same thing. Like, if you're not getting the result you want, you can't yeah. blame other people. Like, if you're in your business, you can't. It's such an advantage when you are an operator like that, because especially in, in your business. Yeah. Well, I love operations. I love operations, you know? Yeah. But that's why I wanted to be a business owner because I love baking, but same thing. For my personality type, which it takes all kinds of personalities, right? I don't want to work for somebody else. I want to learn from other people. I want to be inspired by other people. I want, I don't need to know all things, you know? It's like my business partner was a hedge fund analyst. Like, thank God, you know, and that's why I wanted him to be my business partner because it was like, I want, you know, look around the room. Who has more money, Avery or Andrew? Andrew has more money. Okay, Andrew, how about you be a part of the business? You know about money, you know. Is David involved at all? He is, but he's, you know, for for so long, Manresa, obviously Manresa just closed now two years ago. So he's not a part of our day-to-day operations. He's more a part of like, kind of like long-term planning. And then, and he really has, he always has been more hands-off, which is great. Like, you know, that was a sign of confidence for him, for us with, like I was the baker and Andrew was at the beginning, the business person, but like in terms of, you know, he helped, he wrote our business plan. He, he, he and I learned a lot from him. That's why I wanted both him and David as my business partners. Cause it was like, I want business partners, you know, I can learn from like David's obviously an, an absolutely incredible world-class chef, but also has like created a, a brand in and of himself in Manresa and in like, just like having a career in food. So like, there's just, endless things to learn from there. And I mean, that's what brought me to man race in the first place was to work for David because when I met him in New York, it was like, it was kind of like meeting, it was kind of like when I tried that bread and it was like, this bread is different, right? It was like, David, this person's different. He was fun 
and curious and thoughtful, but also very focused, but also like having a good time. And it was like, this is different, you know? And I really wanted to work in a restaurant at that time that had its own farm. So I wanted to work at a high level, like as in like a multi-Michelin star restaurant. And I wanted to work with somebody who was extremely focused on where their produce was coming from because it's, and it's the same mentality that I've gone to at the bakery. Like, where does my stuff come from? What am I using? Why are we doing this? And yeah. so, yeah. So David's definitely there in that, in those ways. And especially now that Man Race is closed, like is more involved, like with, as we talk about the future and what we're trying to accomplish, we are hoping to kind of like pull him into some of the savory menu stuff as we go into the summer. So oh, that's cool. This summer, we want to expand our hours of operation for some of our cafe for our cafes and kind of, and maybe this will mean that we will ultimately expand our hours permanently. But we thought it would be a fun way in the summer to just stay open a little later and to have a couple additional kind of like happy hour snacks. And so, like working with David on taking some of the things we already are making, like, you know, utilizing our bread or making, you know, a country pate, like, but with David. So I'm excited about that because again, strategically and from an operations standpoint, like how I approach this and where the focus and like, I can see the narrow lane now of what we need to do or how to thread the needle. Whereas like five years ago would have been like, okay, like how would we incorporate David? And, you know, I can go to David now and be like, hey, I really want us to work on a menu item together. Like, it needs to be this to some degree. And then we can create within the bounds that I know we can be successful in. Yeah. Which yeah, is that's cool. a great feeling because yeah. otherwise you can have all the great ideas in the world and you can't make them happen, you know? Yeah. Speaking of so. ingredients, I'm curious if you have thought about or you maybe even started to see the impact of this cocoa crisis that's happening. We haven't just because that's like one of the areas like for us, I mean, I mean, everything has fluctuated in pricing over the last little, you know, over the last couple of years as a bakery, like, you know, we're not a chocolate company. And so we use chocolate. We use Valrona chocolate more or less exclusively right now. But like, that's not a huge portion of our food cost, comparatively yeah. speaking. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know if you've heard how, yeah. I mean, like 70% of the production comes from West, the West no, Coast of Africa. And like no, this El Nino has just like yeah. wiped out. Exactly. So in this one area, we're relatively lucky just because because it's just not something that is a, a giant portion of our of our company. And and, yeah. and I don't see it becoming a giant portion anytime soon. Like we've done a little bit of chocolate work. Again, that's where like it's in an interesting like learning process of being a business owner and being like, I have all the ideas in the world, but like what do our customers actually want from us? Like you can't, people don't want everything from one place. They just don't, you know? And yeah. so that's, yeah. it's both, that's good, but it's also sometimes it's a little sad, but mostly it's good because at least it gives you some limits, you know? Yeah, you so. got to have some focus. Okay, yeah. Ursula on our team. Ursula's okay. like, shout out to Ursula. She's awesome baker, among other things. <laughs> she asked me to ask you if there is another bread program, whether in the States or abroad, that you really admire. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, there are so many. Okay, so I'm going to go two totally different directions. Porto's in L.A., Oh, yeah. Also great food, by the way. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I w We went and we were lucky enough that a friend of a friend knew a lot of the chefs who worked there. And so we were able to go see like their actual production facility. And then we were and then we went to one of their cafes. It was incredible. It was like as the pastry cook who was working with for me at the time who came with me on the tour said, I wouldn't necessarily want to be working at a Porto's level because it's just, it quite literally is like some of it is fully mechanized, but it was such an, such an, they've just done such an incredible job scaling and maintaining quality and maintaining their price point. And it's just, and they do everything from scratch and their everything is extremely affordable. And so it's like, it's their own little, ver it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's better than Panera, obviously, but I mean, like they have it's so complex. And so me as an operator yeah. and a baker, I was just like so amazed by it. Like just, it was incredible. Okay, so, so that's the scale version, side. And then that's the, the other... scale size. And then on the opposite of that would be like, there's a bakery called Elmore Mountain Bread. And so we, our mill is a new American stone mill. And the maker of that mill is a guy named Andrew. And then he and his wife have this bakery. Uh, so it's now he's like made hundreds of mills and they're all over the country. And I think even some of them abroad now, but they also have a beautiful wood fired bakery in Vermont. And it's like, so it's like the opposite end. It's like- We're in Vermont. It's in Wolcott. Wolcott. Oh Vermont. yeah. Okay, cool. And so it's wood fired or tiny, tiny bakery. You know, I think about my future and 
Well, I would open more bakery. Like, obviously, I'm going to continue the growth of this company, you know, like, or however is appropriate, you know, in, in different opportunities present themselves at different times. And, you know, you weigh them and, and, you know, and there's there's like short term goals and there's long term goals. And then you kind of see which, you know, I what I always hope is I try to make decisions and think through things that like these short term goals are going to be the same short term goals, whether we hit the long term goal or not we're still going to be moving in the right direction, right? So I'm not, we're not suddenly like, hey, we should start developing, you know, a, a line of chocolates. Like that's not where we're going to work, right? What we're going to work on is how can we keep making our product fresher and fresher? How can we be baking in the stores with the current stores we have? Because if we open future stores, I want us to bake in the store. Like all my stores right now, there's there's food prepared there, but we bake everything overnight in our bigger productions facility. But if we open stores farther away from this facility, like, and obviously the romance and the joy of having something warm from the oven is the dream, right? But we couldn't grow this business in this area and try to have, from day one, having five separate bakeries. No, couldn't have afforded it, couldn't have any of those things. And so, but then the opposite end of that is like the dream of like a wood-fired bakery like so like the opposite of this basically like a very small wood fire bakery you mill your own flour maybe you even mi mix everything by hand you know i don't know there's a bakery in like outside of quebec where he makes it's a small bakery but he makes everything by hand in like the wooden trough you know so i mean there's so many great bread programs and i like that's how i look at things like how can we take inspiration for other people like i'm not going to suddenly pivot the company but how can i you know, what, what is it that I'm attracted to or drawn to in these other people's businesses? Right. So. Yeah. By the way, you were, you were in New York. I mean, I feel like there's, there's a lot of good bakeries. I mean, there's like Grand Daisy, Pan d'Avignon, yeah. uh, Bianqui, Sullivan. Yeah. Bianqui. Yeah, yeah. I feel there's like they so each had their own, like the semolina raisin from Amy's is mm -hmm. awesome. And then like the, mm -hmm. the baguette from Bianqui was like, did you have a favorite when you were in New York? Uh, she wolf is really good. Oh, yeah. Um, I liked She yes. Wolf a lot. That was kind of, I feel like that was like more my go to because yeah, I like really their style too. of bread too. And they kind of like started a little bit like I started, like they were making bread for the restaurant group and then like that mm -hmm. became its own business. So I really liked their stuff a lot. I love Bianqui, but I think that probably at the time, like She Wolf was probably yeah. my favorite. Yeah. Cool. Well, you kind of answered a question I was going to ask you that I, I ask often, especially to entrepreneurs. But we'll see if it's if it's the same, which is if you had unlimited resources and time and capital, mm -hmm. what would you be doing today differently? You know, if there was unlimited amount of money and time and resources yep. to do exactly what you wanted. It would be two things. It would be continuing to open more stores in on the West Coast right now. But where we're baking in store, it's not a particularly like exciting answer, but it but it's true. Like I love being we, we always called ourselves like a neighborhood bakery, like in the sense that we like have intentionally put our stores inside like little downtowns. Like the only store that we have that's not in a downtown neighborhood area is our Palo Alto store. And then, and we just, because we preferred like the town and country shopping center almost has more of that feel than like downtown California Avenue, Palo Alto. So I'd like to continue to be part of like smaller communities like that if money wasn't a and, and where we were actually baking on site. And then developing a frozen line of products because there are certain things that the joy of baking is such a wonderful joy. The experience of like, I love baking. I love baking and I still love baking. And that feeling of like pulling something out of the oven, not everybody is going to be a great baker, right? So to be able to like share that feeling with people, like I came out with during COVID line of like baking mixes that uses our fresh milled flour. And so we have like a chocolate chip cookie and it's our chocolate chip cookie recipe. We have a brownie and our chocolate chip cookie is made with hundred percent whole wheat. Our brownie recipe is made with rye flour and then our waffle recipe, or it could be waffle or pancakes is made with einkorn flour. And I made those because I loved baking with my parents when I was a kid. Like I loved, my mom and I would bake all sorts of different things, but sometimes as a little kid, we would bake like a Duncan Hines cake box or a box of brownies. And so it was like that feeling of sharing the joy of baking is something that I would really love to, with all of the money and resources in the world, continue to figure out how to be a part of. And so making baking accessible and fun for people when they're not necessarily going to become Baking takes a lot of energy and effort. It's really messy. It takes certain equipment. It takes some quantity of strength. You know, if you want to make 
croissants at home, like you need to be able to lock in dough, like not everybody can do that. Like it just, so to be able to share what I think is really beautiful product, like with more people and not just on the store level, but in the, at the home level, I think that that would be what I'd love to be able to do. Sounds like a great business, by the way. I mean, no one's really <laughs> disrupted Sarah Lee, you know. <laughs> no, they haven't. They haven't. No, but you're right. Right. Yeah. Where are we get? What can we disrupt, please? <laughs> so. That's your next business. I think you've got to do yeah. that because I totally agree, by the way, that you yeah. would, it would crush. Yeah. Uh, especially if you can do it at scale and it works. It, it really it's is. Not, it, it does. Really is and smart. It's special, too. It's yeah. confidence building. It's, and I think that's maybe something not to get like a little bit too soapboxy right now, but. I never thought I'd be a baker, you know? I thought I, I was a political science and international studies double major with a minor in creative writing, you know? Like, and I own a bakery. Like, you and, and you know, I thought I would be a lawyer. I thought I'd be, I don't know what I thought I was going to be, but I definitely didn't think I was going to be a baker. I thought I'd be a writer, but I definitely didn't think baker ever, you know? <laughs> and now I own a, you know, bakery. And so what I mean by this, where what I'm trying to get to is like, for kids, right? Like, I'm in my late 30s and we talk a lot as an owner, we talk a lot about our employees, right? We talk a lot about who's out there right now, what attitudes people have, what people are looking for. And I think a lot about like how lucky I feel that I was still kind of like from a generation where we kind of really were taught if you work hard, you can do anything. You know, I didn't live through a pandemic as a teenager, et cetera. And I feel like people who are in their like now just getting to their early 20s or even a little bit younger, there's like a lot of negativity and a lot of lack of optimism for the future. And I get it. And, but like- Are you seeing that, that I, when you say that, is that anecdotally hearing from your team, from like younger people well, on your team? I, I listen, do you listen to Pivot, the podcast? I don't. I do okay. listen to my young children that are, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I asked this sincerely because I'm like, wait a second. Like, I wonder what's going to happen. Well, so Pivot is a podcast. It's, it's, it's Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway. And Scott Galloway is in a marketing. Well, he's, he's a successful. Oh, yeah, no, Scott. Yeah, he's awesome. They're awesome. And we all, like, a group of us all, like, listen to it, like, religiously. And yesterday, they had on a futurist, okay? And so he was talking about, he, I, I'm not sure who the guy was, but he, he, I guess he's put together a TV show that's coming out that's all, and he goes all over the world and talks to people about the future, basically. He studies the future. But he said, in the poorest countries with the lowest quality of life, when you poll people, people are more opt are more optimistic than so. Like in Africa, in like very poor areas of Africa, extremely optimistic for the future. United States, extremely pessimistic for the future. And he said the difference is, is the word future a noun or a verb? Are you building a future? Or is the future just a thing, right? And so when you ask me if my staff feels that way or how they feel, we have team members who have are building their future. They have come to this country for a better life. You know, they have given up careers. They are nurses. They were doctors. They were electrical engineers. And now they work in a bakery, right? Because they left some other, but they did. They left something that was whatever, unsafe, whatever it might be to build something more for themselves. So I have those team members and they have hope for the future. And then I have team members who are younger, who are not as optimistic, who are a little bit like entitled. We try not to hire, like, you know, we try to like, but but there is sort of this, hey, if you're not happy, you can change your situation. Like, yeah. that's how I feel. But yeah. I definitely see that that's not how everybody feels. It's such a, I mean, this is, I mean, we could talk about this for a very long time, though. Okay. Like America is... There's so much opportunity here. I know. And there's so much that you can do. And to your point, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm in my well, 40s, guess, but we're a similar age of like. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that that's what I was trying to get to with the whole, like the reason I got off on this tangent was because of the idea of this, like these cake mixes. And what I was trying, wanted to say was, how can you build confidence in kids? You know, you need to build confidence in kids. Be and not every kid is going to be a great mathematician. And not every kid is going to be, and that's okay, you know? So it's like having these experiences where kids can have wins that are maybe they don't get wins in other ways, I think is, and yeah. like, that's what I think baking can do for people is like, you're creative, you're working with your hands, you're trying something. The cost of failure is not very high. Like there's all of these positive things that you can learn from baking. Like try, try again, 
I don't know. I just think that there's a lot of power to baking, like for young people too, for anybody, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. My dad bakes and he's in his late seventies and he loves to, and he, it's so cute because he'll, he's a really good baker, but you know, he'll really like worry about making a change and then he'll be like, but then I just did it, you know? And it's like, that's great because here was this man who's a history professor who sat at a desk all his life, like learning, you know, and he's out there playing, you know, it's great. So, yeah. I mean, that is one of those beautiful things that happened during the pandemic with this baking thing that just sort of like erupted. Absolutely. But it is true, you, you know, especially with kids. And I think about this a lot now, especially mine is like, you have to build confidence without entitlement, which is a difficult thing to do, you know, to say, hey, you know, like we want to make sure we're singing all the things that, right. that go well, but remind you that, yeah. like, hey, not everything will go well. And that's okay. No, no. And, and I <laughs> you know. struggled. I My parents, we talked about, like, I was somebody who, like, you know, things came pretty easily to me in life. Like, I was a smart kid. I was really good at school. I loved school. Like, so when, when I got to a place where it was like, when things start, were difficult, it took me, my mom was like, you know, we had to, we couldn't let you win the, you know, shoots and ladders when you were a kid because you had to learn, like, and you did not do well when we, when we actually, we, we didn't let you win, you know, we beat you, you were a mess, you know, but we had to do that because that's what parenting was because you had to learn not everything's going to go your way. And yeah. And there's a difference, like you're saying, in confidence. Hey, I can try this. That feeling of belief in yourself that doesn't have to do with success. It's not about success, right? It's about believe. There's a difference, right? Because if your success is, belief in self is only associated with success, then it can be taken away from you, right? Shit happens. Well, yeah, and I think it's how you define success, which is well, which is so sure. important, right? Is if you, for sure. if the way you associate success is, my business is going well, thus I'm successful. Right. Like you're successful, Avery, because you love baking and somehow you've got yeah. to be able to create a world exactly. where you get to do that all the exactly. time. And exactly. that's the success. Even if you scaled, you know, whether you scale up to a hundred of these or you right. stay at six or you go down no, to five, and, and like it, you're doing the to, thing that you love. And it has to make you happy too. Like if, like that's part of like the being mature too, I think, and growing up is like realizing like there's, there's a cost to everything, right? So having a hundred of these might not be the worth the cost, but like, you know, what, what are you willing to like negotiate or not negotiate with? Right. So, you know, like, I think you have to be able to have your eyes wide open and really see the cost and the benefit of things in business. Right. I mean, and, and being a creative entrepreneur, because just because something's possible doesn't mean you should do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's also a stage of the business that you might be right for and might not be right. You might get to 25. Yeah, for sure locations and decide, you know what, I'm not the CEO anymore. <laughs> Somebody else should be and I'll yeah. be a creative director or something. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. It's and then like I said, we we really are still quite a small management team. And that's something, you know, there are hard days where you like want to affect change and it's it's hard and it's tough. And you have to kind of sometimes say, okay, like today was not a, a win. Let's start again tomorrow. You know, like sometimes you get you get like frustrated or you get, you know, like learning what the reality, like having a great idea and then we're learning what the reality of it's going to take to make that idea come to life, you know? And I definitely, my, one of my biggest lessons that I try to remind myself of this is like, I used to be extremely unrealistic about how fast things could change or be done. Things that I thought should take a month really take three months. And things that I think were going to take six months take 18 months. There were things I thought we were going to do when we met, got to this facility that this facility would let us be able to do that we're just getting to. And it's like, but that's okay. We're getting there, you know, and 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 we're doing it the right way. So patience, you really have to have the patience because otherwise it's, you're not really building the foundation. And then it, it you, you find out that it's really just that one person who's doing things the way you need them done. And if they leave, you didn't actually build a system. You just had a good employee, you know? Yeah, so, yeah 100%. You know. Well, Look, I'm so excited for what you're building. I'm Thank you. excited also to go visit <laughs> soon. I'm Definitely. East Coast, but you know, next time on the West Coast. Congratulations on everything. Thank you. On business and the growth and what you're doing. It's really amazing. I'm really grateful we got to have this conversation. Me too. This is really lovely. Thanks so much. I really appreciated it. Yeah. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, 
I'd love it if you can share it with fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcast. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little bit better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.